Okay. Okay, and they should people should just sort of start to roll in here automatically. It, it's it's quite good. It sort of feeds them in and it doesn't instantly dump them all in. It sort of they they weave in sort of in a wave. Takes a minute or two. Very good. We had a big rush of registrations this morning. I should look and see how many we're expecting here real quick. Something different to do on a Friday morning. Yeah. Um, it's been, uh, we had a board meeting yesterday and the board members were saying that they're all getting lots and lots of different webinar options and, and are jumping in and out. Um, I, I quite often listen to webinars as I work anyway. I find that it sort of breaks my day up a little bit even. Um, and so a lot of people were talking about that that's now a new, sort of a new behavior they're adopting as well. Just, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're used to working in an office, it's that sense of background noise, right? That is always there. Yeah. That you that you lose. Like I always have music on in the house. In fact, I bought more Alexas so that I could have, um, you know, music, the same music as I wander through the house plays now. Fair. All right. For those of you that are just logging in, we're still waiting on about another 15 people, so we'll give them just a couple more minutes. Um, this session is going to be recorded, just to give you a warning. Um, so in this session, or in this system, it's really helpful. There's a number of features, and they're all in that black bar down the bottom. You are all on mute. You can't unmute yourself. Um, so if you wish at some point to ask a question verbally, what you're going to need to do is have your uh, participant window open, and that will allow you to put your hand up. Um, the participant window has a little button at the bottom. It'll let you do thumbs up. It'll let you say thumbs down. It'll let you say go faster, slower. Um, it'll also allow you to put your hand up if you want to verbally ask a question, in which case I will unmute you and you will be able to talk. Um, you can also post comments and questions into the chat window. Um, if, I recommend you post to everyone and then everyone can see and respond and interact. Um, and then if you have a question that you're happy to type out, please use the questions tab, the Q&A tab. That will allow you to post those questions. They'll sit open. If, um, if Lorena if Lorene, um, answers them verbally, I will mark them off. If it's something technical like I'm having a problem with my sound or whatnot, um, I, will, I will address those sort of like tech support. I'll be on live throughout the call. Um, there will be a recorded version later. Um, it will get out, I will send you an email. I think it comes out 24 hours after the webinar. Uh, it, for those of you in the room, it will it'll say, hey, thanks for coming, here's the link. For those of you who, if there's anyone who doesn't make it into the actual session who was registered, they will get a, hey, sorry, we missed you email with the, with the link to that as well. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, there will also be some polls. Polls, when we set them off, will automatically launch on your screen. You will need to click on them um, in order to respond. Uh, it's our first time using polls, so I have no idea how this is going to go. And of course, now my dogs are barking. <laughs> it never fails. Um, so yes, uh, bear with us. It's it's. Both of us first, it's my second webinar, it's Lorene's first, um, there's polls, we're using all sorts of the fun stuff, uh, so there's a high probability that things could go awry, bear with us, um, absolutely. Uh, most of the people are here, it is three or four minutes after, I think we're probably good to go, I'm going to start the recording now, I think. Um, just so you are aware, anything in the chat window is also recorded um, if it's public. If it's if it's from you to one of between two 
of you privately doesn't record, but anything that's to all panelists or all attendees, that is recorded as part of the session. All right, I'm going to throw the recording on as soon as I reload. Pause or stop recording. Apparently it's already recording. That seems really unlikely. Um, stop video, share, polls, chat. Never mind, it was already recording. I'll just chop that <laughs> off later. All right, um, so that being said, it's uh, on behalf of ALA, I'm really pleased to um, in, introduce Lorreen. Um, she'll probably talk a, a little bit more about herself, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, I can tell you I saw, I was able to access this presentation at the Alberta Rec and Parks Association Parks Forum right before we all started social distancing and quarantining and whatnot. Uh, and that's why I thought it was really important that I bring this to you guys as members so you could have access to this information. I really want to thank her for taking the time out to do this. Um, and I'm, uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Todd. I, like Todd said, I was able to present at Parks Forum before we have been banished to our homes. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get this information out there because awareness around historic resources is varied throughout numerous industries. So at Parks Forum, the topic or the theme was parks, landscapes and open spaces, parks and resilience. And so this is basically the same presentation with a couple of polls thrown into it. Um, like Todd said, new to using polls, so we'll see how this goes. And I'm hoping by the end of today that you look at landscapes a bit differently from a slightly different perspective. So for our first poll, I'm interested in finding out how many of us would consider ourselves stewards of the land. So I'm guessing the poll is gonna jump up. There we go. And so I'll let that come through. So the majority, it looks like the majority of us think that we steward the land in our roles, our professional roles. So I agree. I think if our professions have us dealing with the landscape in any way, we have some degree of steward influence over it. So at this point in time though, it's very important that, oh, apparently I can't advance the slides while the poll is still open. Okay, perfect. So, like I said, the majority of us would consider that. I'm going to just click that. <laughs> and it came back up. Did it go away now? Yeah, it's good. Oh, no, can't advance just yet. There we go. It's important that we acknowledge the original stewards of the land. Um, our indigenous populations, they were the first stewards of the land. They depended on the land for sustenance, shelter, medicine, and ceremony. In Alberta, we have 45 different First Nations within three treaty areas. Treaty 8 is in the north, Treaty 6 is throughout central Alberta, and being in Calgary, Treaty 7 is the one that I am most familiar with, so I do want to acknowledge the different groups within Treaty 7, including the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, with Siksika, Bigani, and Kainai Nations. The Yinare Nakoda, with Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley Nations. The Sutina First Nation, as well as the historic homeland of the Northwest Métis. Today, the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And why do I feel this is important? Well, we have come to a point in our society that we acknowledge um, <clears throat> our indigenous neighbors and the importance that they have played in preserving the land over the years. And so in my role 
as an archaeologist, I many times am excavating their history. And so I feel very honored to be a part of sharing that information, even if it is from a scientific point of view. So today, I am going to go over what archaeology is. And being an archaeologist, this is going to be the focus for today. The Historical Resources Act, what that approval process looks like. I'm hoping that everyone can understand Section 31 by the end of this. Obviously, the importance of parks and open spaces. And I'm going to touch on Edworthy Park, Nose Hill Park, Pascapoo Medicine Hill, 12 Mile Cooley. And I just realized that I didn't really introduce myself, so I'll take like two seconds to do that. So um, I worked as a consulting archaeologist for years before joining the city, and I work within the cultural landscapes portfolio of Calgary Parks. And so within that role, it's working to advance the strategic initiatives in the cultural landscape strategic plan. And archeology span is one of those. Parks are very important in that they are one of the only place within urban settings where we can conserve archeological resources. So hence, I am here today and I get the pleasure to talk to different groups helping increase awareness uh, across the city and province. Okay, so what is archeology? span And we do have a poll for this as well. So I will let Todd cue that up, eventually. There we go. So what do you think of when you hear archeology? span and granted, some of you may not have um, the answers up there. You can also type into the chat window if there's something like, it's none of those. I have one distinct thing that I think of when I hear of archaeology. Um, feel free to type into the chat window. Traces of the past, I like it. So we'll give it about 10 more seconds, maybe. I'm surprised no one said the Curse of Oak Island. I got that at the last presentation. Okay. Time team. That is something I'm not familiar with. Jason, you're going to have to, uh, in the discussion at the end, you're going to have to fill me in on that. So um, it looks like the majority of us think of ancient, ancient ruins. A few people thought of Egypt initially. Dinosaurs are in there. And a couple other fossils, absolutely, that comes up. Um, so I'm going to close this window and see if I can advance the slides now. So I'm going to start with what it's not, because this is something that is quite prevalent. Most archaeologists get this. So we don't deal with dinosaurs um, or fossils, for that matter. That um, is paleontology. So it's kind of a sister science. It is covered under the Historical Resources Act. So it's within the same realm, but it's not archaeology. So the poll did indicate that people often think of ancient ruins. Many people have asked if I've worked in Egypt. Some folks think of Roman ruins. Is there anything else that people can think of? The majority of these um, impressions typically come from TV. And uh, where else? Who, what other characters can we think of? Quite often, I get this guy. Depending on the age of the audience, I may get people referring to this gal as well. But 
mainstream media has basically have, have us believing that this is what archaeology is. And most of us don't think of it in our own backyard. And why is Alberta archaeology less known? Why is it that we don't talk about it with our neighbors? It's much less blatant than these grandiose ruins. This is an example of a gravel sorting bin associated with one of the earliest gravel quarries in Calgary. It dates to the late 1800s. This is a railway maintenance house. This was found when uh, park staff were rerunning a irrigation line. What's kind of neat about this, um, the railway used to run by the, by the river here in Calgary. And so right along here, this is a close up, you can see the ballast that was placed around the concrete foundation. You can actually see the original wood that was used to make the forms in which the concrete was poured. This maintenance house dates to the early 1900s and this ballast was basically to cushion the concrete foundation from the railway which would have been a couple meters over the, on this side of the building. These bottles were found at this location. They still had liquid in them wouldn't want to open that. We thought about calling hazmat. You never know after a hundred years what it may be, but uh, it's pretty remarkable when you start finding these small tokens of the past. In one of our parks projects, we came across some wood cribbing and we engaged an archaeologist to come out and they did backhoe testing and they had found this wood lined well. At the bottom there was a pipe and they dropped a rock down there and you could hear it hit water, which is pretty fascinating. Um, also in this well they found a beautiful enamel pot which we joked, obviously, someone probably got in trouble for dropping it down the well because it was in great condition. And back then, you probably didn't have multiple pots that you worked with. Um, we found a skate blade. What's interesting in places like wells, and for that fact, privies, privies are a gold mine to archaeologists. Think about it. Where would you throw things that you don't want other people to know about? So from an archaeological point of view, when we find artifacts in those settings, it can tell us a lot about the people utilizing those features. Um, there's been wine bottles found in uh, privies associated with nunneries, which is always interesting, um, or Dukabor villages. So these things we're kind of familiar with. We get little pieces of bottle. Here's a magne manganese um, glass bottle top and the bases. On the bottom of uh, bottles, and we, we look at the impressions because they can tell us a lot about when the bottles are made. Also, any decoration or maker's marks will tell us where they were produced and where they were brought from. This water main was found. It's a historic structure. We don't necessarily think about that. We think about these things as just old stuff. Now, our, our my colleague didn't realize that this was a historic structure. And after I saw this on the news, I called him up and I said, so did you have trouble? Do you need help with preservation? I can connect you with the conservationist at the museum because we want to be able to keep this in this amazing condition and he said we found that two months ago it now looks like this. The sad thing about this is that this is a piece of Calgary history. It reflects early industry. These water mains there was actually clear water in them still and you think 
we know where these things are. Well, we don't know that where they are. As built is never quite the same as our plans. And back then, if we even have the plans for them, uh, they aren't quite as accurate as those that we get today. And so they now know we just need to have someone on site to record where these features are or where these structures are. And one thing about archaeologists, even though we kind of live in the past and we put together the mystery, the puzzle of the past, we also have to think about future generations. And so right now people would say, okay, this stuff, nothing in 1940s would be considered historic. The cutoff is actually 50 years. And that is because 100 years from now, what is 50 years old is going to seem, it will be much older, and it will be a part of the past that people may not be able to connect to. And so as we conserve aspects of history, whether it be archaeological resources or historic structures, we have a responsibility to future generations. Now, this is a part of history that many of us are not familiar with. Uh, this timeline basically shows from when mammoths were present post-glaciation and spears were used, the use of dog, this is a volcano. We will touch on that. You, you are probably thinking what on earth is a volcano doing there? A change in technology to atlatls, the introduction of the bow and arrow, the introduction of the horse, trade goods, and ultimately the railway and coming and bringing Europeans. This certainly is a way of life that we've only seen on TV. Evidence of this does exist in our urban settings. It's just deeply buried. And in, in some places, not deeply buried. It is on the surface. We just don't recognize it. And so it's more difficult for us to connect with. The historic elements, we can see those at places like Heritage Park here in Calgary or other museums. and. So it's easier for us because they're familiar to our own lives. It is so much more difficult for people to identify archaeological sites that were produced or were, reflect the remains of this way of life. Here's an example. These are archaeologists working in a cut bank. You can see the different dark Paleosoles. The hearth features are fire pits. Right here is a portion of a stone circle or a ring wall. And heat treating feature, you can either heat up stone or bones um, stone to make it easier to use uh, to flint nap into stone tools. This is a hearth. Most people wouldn't be able to look at that and say, oh, that's an archaeological site. And the problem with this is that if we don't know what they look like, if we aren't sharing this information with our contractors and advising them that when they come across these things, they need to stop and bring in some professionals to assess whether it is or not, we're losing them. And this way of life no longer exists in our urban settings. And a lot of our indigenous neighbors, they may not be connected to this way of life due to government policies or what have you that ultimately changed their way of life forever. And so by us working to conserve these sites, we are allowing for future generations to connect with their ancestors and the way of life in the past. So this is a hearth feature similar to this. This is just the cross section of it. You can kind of see some red staining depending on your monitor quality and some rocks around it. This is what I was referring to when I said paleosol. I'm sure you're familiar. 
where the AH horizon starts to um, form. And typically, these are the first sort of areas that we'll look for archaeological materials. But again, they can be anywhere within the stratigraphic profile. Archaeologists do look for staining, ash lenses, red staining from the oxidation of soils. But a lot of people wouldn't be able to recognize this as a roasting pit where you have rock, bone pieces, charcoal. Now, one of the most diagnostic artifacts for archaeologists, one of the first sort of indicators of an archaea site is called uh, fire broken rock or fire cracked rock. And in uh, person, I would be holding up an example of that, but it, it's basically rock that distinct, breaks in a very distinctive way. And the reason it breaks in that way is because it was used, rocks were heated up in fires and used to boil water and cook food. And so this, these types of sites, it's a challenge if you're not trained to fully understand what you may be seeing. So I don't expect you to be like, this is be able to tell your contractors exactly what to look for, but we will get to where you will have an opportunity. You do have an opportunity um, and you don't have to know what these things look like in order to help conserve them. You wonder why archaeologists have bad backs because we map bison kill sites bent over like this. <laughs> So you can see here, this is, was a bison kill that was within the Pascapu Slopes area. And this is a one meter by one meter frame with the wire set across it. And the archeologist here is drawing every little bone. So we map the entire bone bed. And sometimes the single site will have multiple of these. It's, very time consuming, but the information that you get out of these maps in this site is remarkable. You can tell the populations, you can tell the seasonality of when the event occurred. There's a, uh, it is a mystery and it's quite interesting, but really archeology span is the study of activity and it's through the recovery of material mains. So this way of life existed Today, we see it manifested as this and this, whereas, and so just to be clear, the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material remains, that is a scientific, a scientific um, lens. Whereas culture, that's the social behaviors and norms. I, as an archaeologist, can only ever speak. Oh, is there a. You need to unmute yourself. James had a question there, but I'll let you finish the thought. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll finish this slide and then I'll touch base on that question. So, as an archaeologist, I can over, only ever speak to the scientific side, the cultural side, those social behaviors, the norms that are present within the society. There is an indigenous lens that is related to the relationship to the land. And there is no way I am qualified to speak to that. That is something that we have to engage our elders and traditional knowledge keepers on. And the relationship between that information and regulation is evolving. There was a time when we couldn't share information with elders, which is so crazy. Um, that is just starting to change. Still have to get permission from the government to share it, but it's becoming more acceptable to share that information, which I am totally uh, for 
I, I, I want to be able to get all sides of the picture because without both, without the scientific showing the activities in the daily life of these people and the cultural side reflecting why those activities took place in that spot, in that way, the story isn't complete without both sides. So I'm going to go back. There's a question from James. Why not take a picture for mapping? So there's photographs taken um, at every site. The maps are part of a requirement associated with, so every study that happens, the province has specific permit requirements uh, that the permit holder permit holding archaeologist has to fulfill within their reports and the maps are part of that. So everything is drawn, everything. Um, so they know exactly where that artifact was found within the site as a whole. And if you just take a picture, you can't necessarily tie an artifact to a location all that well. Um, photographs are taken of every unit and you'll see um, in a couple of slides, a uh, plan view as well as a, a drawing of a teepee ring. And it's just part of our requirements that we have to meet. So our next poll, there's two of them. Have you ever worked with an archeology? There's also a question from, before we leave that oh. concept of mapping, um, from Corey Rockle asking, uh, about 3D scanning technology? There is. So there's a bunch of different technologies out there and consultants are starting to um, promote 3D scanning and it is a, a fabulous way. I, I think it's probably the way of the future. Right now it depends on the client as to whether they want to use that it's not a requirement from the government, let's say. It would be a, an extra if, if the client wanted to agree to use that. I think there's a lot of valuable information in the 3D scanning, particularly for buildings. I haven't seen um, the utilization for a, something like a bone bed or a stone circle. Hopefully, uh, I, I know a couple of archeologists who, who would love for me to get them to do that. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the budgets say after all of this, after our current situation is resolved. <laughs> so um, we'll get back to the poll if that is answered. Uh, have you ever worked with an archeologist? And then also, did you incorporate any of the findings into your project? And we'll just let that go for a little bit. Wow, I'm loving seeing the fact that people incorporated some of the findings and I definitely want to hear those stories at the end. Okay, 24 of 30, 80% voted. Okay, I think that, oh, 90% voted. I think we can probably so the majority of folks haven't worked with archeologists um, and some did incorporate, others say the findings weren't applicable. Okay, so in my work, I've identified that a lot of times, um, not everyone realizes that they have to do uh, historic check, uh, consideration of historic resources on their projects. Um, a lot of people are getting much better, but people also don't understand the regulatory framework um, and what you may have heard an HRV or a historic resource value associated with land and people aren't sure what that is. Um, so I'm going to touch upon the regulation of archaeology, and then I'll go through the act and talk about HRVs and 
make a couple of notes on how you can help and potential things that we can do to incorporate some of that information. And even if it's not incorporated right away, the value of the information for future projects. And you can all have a role in ha having the conversation with your clients. And so archeology span is provincially regulated. It's the province of Alberta. It is a legal requirement. The ministry is Alberta Culture, Multiculturalism, Multiculturalism and Status of Women. That changes every election, but the Historic Resource Management Branch, they don't change their name with every election. So um, you can always Google Historic Resource Management Branch and they get contacts. Or you can Google Historical Resources Act, Alberta, and that will take you to the legislation and the pages the provincial page is where you can find out more information. So here just to, is an example of a teepee ring that was mapped. And so what they would have done is the excavation units would have been one meter by one meter by one meter across this site. And then the small X's reflect pieces of bone or pieces of stone, depending on the little uh, representation. And then the arc itself, you have an internal hearth, you have an external hearth, you have a small altar, and you see a dense concentration of really fine artifacts in the middle. This helps tell us sort of how the activities were taking place within a stone circle, within this particular stone circle. And this was, is a stone circle um, in 12 Mile Coulee. And the developer, when they, after they finished the study, they took these rocks and embedded it, embedded them into cement. So as you, there's a picnic area in the coulee down in the park. And if you walk just up a trail away from that picnic area, you can come across a concrete pad that has stone circles with the ring rocks embedded in it. Now, that is a great interpretive element. Uh, you can do tours there. The hope is that we can get signage. Um, given that it is a indigenous site, any sort of signage that we prepare would have to have input engagement with the nations for content. Uh, the city isn't going to put up uh, signage without that information. Just representing the scientific side on this, that's, that's okay in tours if we can't have the other side available, but when it's signage, we wanna make sure that we are inclusive with that information. So the act itself, like I said, it covers a bunch of different things, including paleontology. So archeology, span we know what that is. There's historic, there's pre-contact. Cultural, you're looking at traditional use sites or burials. Historic, buried foundation, coal chutes, historic water mains. Paleontology is the fossils, and it can be everything from fish found in the Pascapu formation that are 60 million years old to dinosaurs. The geological resources would be the large erratics like big rock and the natural resources, the Douglas fir trees associated with the Douglas fir trail, those are actually the easternmost instance of that tree species. And they were integral in the early settlement of the area. Now I mentioned the listing of historic resources and an HRV. Now the HRV, we're, we're gonna talk about the historic, the listing um, a little bit more, but the listing is a big list of parcels of land and they have a historic resource value attributed to the land. That is what is, the listing is comprised of. So we have categories of historic resources, we have the listing, and then the province also has land use bulletins. 
And there's a variety of subjects like utility distribution, subdivision, geotechnical exploration. There's integrity digs, oil sands, small scale, oil and gas, surface materials. There's a variety of bulletins. But basically what it comes down to is that if there's an HRV attributed to the land, you need to reach out to the province. And realistically, many types of development are required to obtain approval. And that's prior to the onset of development activity. So that's before ground disturbance happens. And it can take, depending upon what happens, it can take anywhere from six weeks to a few months if you need to do excavations. So the listing of historic resources. Here's that stone circle that we saw the drawing of earlier. This is the picture taken afterwards. Um, so the listing, here's an example. Like I said earlier, this presentation was given in Canmore. So here's Canmore and here's Calgary. And those parcels of land colored are the listing. So the listing is basically just a tool it's not comprehensive. If there's a value, you need to reach out to the province. Or there, it is possible that your project doesn't have an HRV, but there is a land use bulletin that says you need to reach out to the province. The listing, you can download it. You can actually download in GIS format. So I would encourage all of the firms out there that have GI, which I, these days everyone has GIS capabilities for the most part, to download and overlay it onto your projects and have the conversation with your clients. So, and this is province wide. So each of those parcels of land are attributed an HRV. Just because this one right here doesn't have an HRV does not mean that there isn't anything there. There is, it's possible. It just means that nothing's been found there yet. So, the green bits are HRV4, so that means that there are known sites at those locations. The different colors represent different HRV levels. We don't need to go into that level of detail. This is Nose Hill. Um, the yellowy brown color, that represents HRV5. And this is the one that uh, we have the most questions, or I get the most questions about. Just because it has an HRV5, it means there's potential for something to be there. But I quite often get the question, do we have to submit an application for HRV5? I say, well, it says there's potential. Um, in an urban setting, this can be a challenging tool to use. And we are working with the province on refining it but we need to consider historic resources in our projects. And if there's an HRV, submitting an application is quite easy. There's the online tool and you can set up an OPAC, an online permitting and clearance is the name of the, tool, uh, the platform. And you can set up a profile for your company and then have someone input the information for the projects. It does not take a long time. If you have shape files, upload those and it typically makes the review happen faster. Um, but I want to encourage everyone to be submitting these applications. Now, I totally understand um, being in parks, we have citizens saying, why isn't my park done? And you may have clients that say, well, why do I have to do this? And you can fall back on the fact that it is a legal requirement. Um, in the city, we have a professional code of conduct. And part of that is, are we okay if citizens know that this is how we are going about our business. And so would we be okay that to proceed with a park development and have citizens know that we are not considering historic resources? I'm gonna guess that most people will say, 
okay, no, we have to make sure that we're doing this. There could be some outliers and be like, well, no, my, I want my park. I don't care, just get it done. To those folks, remember, this way of life doesn't exist for Indigenous peoples anymore within these urban settings. And if we don't consider it, we could be inadvertently destroying their heritage. And so I would challenge people who say, no, I want my park. Okay, go to an elder and say it to their face that you are not going to consider their heritage before developing your park. Most of us during this time of truth and reconciliation, there's a moral trigger there for us and we fall back on doing the right thing. So once we know the information, it makes it a lot easier. Hence this presentation today. So I'm gonna pre briefly go through sort of a typical process and it's not the same for everyone. This is just super high level summary. At the initiation, that's your first opportunity. You know where it's going. So I saw a question, I saw a couple of questions come up. Before I get into this, I will, archeologists are supposed to be invited on all project sites? If not, what types of sites should one be invited? So typically, um, we'll go through this in this format, but um, they don't have to be invited to every site. If you check out the listing and identify your requirements early on, that will help tell you, and you want to do this work as early as possible. You don't want to, it may happen that you uncover something during construction, but Usually, if you're able to do your due diligence in the early planning stages, um, you won't have to have them come out on site during construction. And I'll touch base on the rest of that question throughout this slide. Um, and the next question is, do we need to make applications for HRA approval for every project site or only for projects that have HRV designation? have an associated land use bulletin or and or if something is found. So not every, um, it, the HRV is the first trigger and that would sort of be your very, it covers a lot of land, particularly within an urban setting like Calgary. Um, there are specific triggers and just because it has an HRV doesn't mean that you're going to have to have an archaeologist come out. Um, and I'm going to talk about section 31 right away. So I'll, I'm hoping that this slide will touch on all of the answers to that question. But if it doesn't, please put your hand up or make another note. Um, so as early as you can, you know the, the land on which your project is going to be check the listing of historic resources. If you have downloaded the GIS version, you can take the shape files from your proposed project area, plunk it down, and it will immediately tell you what historic resource values, if any, are associated with that land. If you have it, as soon as you have a preliminary design where you have an idea of how deep you're gonna be going, because it, there's a footprint aspect to this, but there's also the depth aspect. In some areas, you may not be required to do additional studies because you're only gonna be impacting the top 10 centimeters, depending upon where your development is. If it's next to a river where there has been lots of flooding over the years, and there's no chance that there's any sites in the top 10 centimeters, um, there's so many variables involved in this. It can be a challenge, which is why I would encourage folks to um, check the listing. You can fill out your own applications and it is fairly straightforward. You need to get an OPAC um, an account 
Now, that said, archaeologists are able to take all the information about your development and include, and, and we have access to the information about um, what sites may be there, the types of sites, the depth those sites are at, if any. And so we can do a better analysis to understand if what the chance is of the project impacting the sites. And we can make a recommendation. If there's really little chance, we can say, you know, we would recommend Historical Resources Act approval for this application. Whereas if individual companies submit their own, you don't really have that um, expertise to be able to understand the ability of your project to impact any resources that may be there. So you can submit it yourself. Um, engaging a historic resource consultant may give you a bit of an edge um, in the content of that application, that's all. So as a result of your application, you will get either approval and all approvals are subject to section 31 or you'll get site-specific Historical Resource Act requirements. And so remember, we need to know how deep it's going. So if you have a rough idea, you can say the maximum depth, depth could be six meters because we have some piles associated with a house structure or something like that. So if there's uh, specific requirements associated, they may require you to do a historic resource impact assessment Basically, an archaeologist will go out there and do backhoe testing or shovel testing, depending upon where the development is. And they may not find anything, but they may find a site. If they come across a site and the site cannot be avoided, they will recommend further work. And so the province really wants people to, like the first preference would be avoidance. It's cheaper for clients, not doing additional uh, mitigation studies, but also we want to conserve sites where possible. Because again, sites are finite. Once they are gone, they are gone. This type of site is not being created anymore. So the HRIA, is the initial impact assessment. HRIM is impact mitigation. And there can be multiple stages depending upon the types of sites you're finding. We have um, archeologists that worked in Pascapu who did hundreds of meters of excavation prior to sewer line going in because of the importance of a site. And so in mitigation, basically the archaeologist is going to dig and you, the government will say, okay, you have this many meters, use them to get the best sample. And the archaeologist is going to use those meters and recommend more only to the point where you excavate to the point where further excavation isn't going to um, produce more inf different information about the site. Basically, you've excavated to the point where you know pretty much everything that's going on and there won't be anything drastically different. So at that point, you can say the site has been mitigated and recommend approval. The mitigation will offset the destruction of the site going forward. Again, that can be costly. So if avoidance is possible, that would be um, preferable for a lot of clients. And I made a reference to permit requirements. Every permit, so in order to do archeology span and be a, a permit holder and run the projects, in Alberta, you have to have a master's and there's specific requirements. So you have to have permit holding ability given to you by the province. And there's specific requirements that are outlined and for every permit you have, you have your post field work submission that includes photographs, maps, a photograph catalog, the artifacts, the artifact catalog, and a very detailed specific report with different sections that are um, 
prescribed as to the content in the report itself. And so uh, a lot of clients, when I was an archaeologist, they, they understand that you have to write a report, but um, I did one oil sands project once and the report at the end was 1500 pages. And the client, when I sent it to her to do a review, she said, submit it, it's fine. <laughs> I can totally understand. It, it's a very technical document. And if I wasn't, if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't um, necessarily go through it either. But that said, if the government issues you a requirement letter, talking about reports and letters, um, an archeologist or a historic resource consultant can help you uh, decipher or interpret what the report and letter says. Because sometimes reports recommend further work um, in certain areas. At this point in your project, ask yourself if your footprint has changed. Did you include all your temporary workspace? Is there anything out there that we didn't include in the original submission? You need to consider all of these aspects when you are um, considering historic resources throughout your project. So on occasion, the province may want monitoring. This typically happens more often for paleontology than it does archeology, span but it, it does occur for archae as well. And that will just entail, um, sometimes this happens when the project is at a stage and the likelihood is that it probably won't impact, but there is a chance and say it's one feature for instance, um, piles that have to be drilled down for a playground structure. The government may say, we just want an archaeologist on site when you're doing that one element, just to make sure nothing's uh, impact. And if it is, the archaeologist would have to record what was found, assess the further impact to that area, and it's usually a conversation with the regional archaeologist, and then you proceed. And so section 31 at construction and pro even after project closure, section 31, I need to read it out specifically what it says, because it's applicable to basically any digging anywhere, anytime. So, and all approvals. So even if you have your approval in place, the approval is subject to section 31. Just because you have approval doesn't mean that you may not come across something. It means that you can proceed we don't have a high probability of something being there, but if you do come across something, you need to stop and call us. And the actual wording is any person who discovers a historic resource in the course of making an excavation for a purpose other than for the purpose of seeking historic resources shall forthwith notify the minister of the discovery. And so basically if you come across something, stop, contact the province. And there's a report a find location or um, website. And if you have already worked with an archeologist, you can call them up and say, look, we came across something. Can you, can you get out here? Can you coordinate with the province? And typically section 31 finds, depending on what it is, it doesn't slow down things too much. Um, that, find that we had in um, the park, the irrigation, the old maintenance house for the railway. The archaeologists went out there, they recorded everything, and wrote a report, and I think it was four or five days, and the crew was able to work on another portion of the project in the meantime. So work with your historic resource consultants. They really, the province doesn't want to stop everything. The consultants don't want to stop everything but we want to ensure that we are conserving any information that we do come across. And from a municipal point of view, are there any stories? What is this information that you have gathered? Is there something, is there any opportunity for interpretive elements to be incorporated into the design? So section 31, we touched on it. I read you the formal, but it can happen anywhere. Uh, backhoe uh, community 
not a community, uh, developers were excavating up in Tuscany and they came across pieces of bone. And after the fella stopped panicking, because initially he thought it was a human, after he realized that it wasn't a burial, um, he contacted the province and the archeologists called me. And this is not the normal process, but um, I was doing site visits in the park anyway, nearby, so, and he knew that. So he called me, he's like, hey, can you pop over here and have a quick look? Turns out that, yes, they came across bone. It was a bison kill, but it was from a site that had been mitigated when Tuscany was developed as a community. So once a site is mitigated, it may not be completely destroyed. There could be elements of it that are still intact. And when those are in parks, it's fabulous because we can use them for future interpretive opportunities and uh, experience. In this case, it just really throws the backhoe operators for a scary loop, but they did the right thing. They called the province. This literally was an hour out of their time, and they thought it was super cool. They just wanted to keep digging, looking for stuff. But we uh, had the conversation, we took a look, had a conversation with the province, and yeah, within an hour they were on their way. So it doesn't have to stop things, um, but this is a perfect example of section 31. Here's a distal tibia that I actually tripped over as I was walking down a path in Pascapu. Um, it's within a known site area and I just kind of tucked it back into place. Uh, we can't collect these things. That is against the law. Um, we cannot collect historic resources unless we have a permit to do so. So in this case, put it back out of, out of the way. And um, if that site is ever excavated, this information will still be there. Because it could be, um, we use distal ends of bones to determine a minimum, minimum number of individuals at sites for how many animals were dispatched and whether they're male or female. So when we take things away from sites, it alters the data set and doesn't necessarily show a clear picture of what's going on. So here's the report of find website location and like Todd said this this is being recorded and we'll, you can access it after the fact but um, you can always just google Historic Resources Act Alberta and it'll take you to several pages of information. So like I said confidentiality of sites is a good thing um, because it can conserve sites, but it's also a bad thing. And if people don't know about it, they won't value it. And so while site locations are protected under the act, we cannot share them in case people decide to get excited and go looking for things. Um, the problem is that ignorance ends up causing inadvertent destruction. And just because we don't know about it does not excuse um, it doesn't prevent that destruction. And like I mentioned before, we all have a responsibility. So hopefully um, we're moving towards sort of a new way of life in that we can share some of this information. Um, just on that, the municipality, I'm the, I was the third municipal archeologist in Canada. Uh, Montreal has one that's, uh, since the 80s focused on historic buildings. In 2016, Vancouver's Parks Board um, hired Jordi Howe, and I believe they have a second one now. But in between, uh, in 2017, I joined Calgary, and one of, uh, part of my mandate is helping increase the understanding for citizens with respect to this unseen heritage. And we're hoping that once people start understanding it, they will start valuing it and then people will care and ultimately get to the point where we can share public archaeology um, elements, have an archaeology day, have public archaeology excavations. Like my dream is to have uh, citizens and elders and Indigenous youth working together 
in a setting uncovering and learning from each other, I think that would be um, a significant step for us to make um, in the conservation of these sites. So I'm going to touch on the importance of parks and open spaces and go through a couple of parks and then hopefully leave about 10 minutes at the end for extra questions. And I'll be available after if you are. Um, but yeah, here you can see the red dots, hopefully, or the dots, if they're not red to you, um, showing those sites that are within Calgary Parks. Obviously, you can see Nose Hill, you can see Pascapoo, um, West Nose Creek, Nose Creek, 12 Mile Cooley, Simons Valley, natural areas. So conservation, what can we do in the municipality? At the area structure plan phase, at the area redevelopment phase, certainly within parks, capital projects and operations, we have the opportunity to look at potential for historic resources. Are there historic resources, known historic resources present? And what can we do with that information? How can we share it to help citizens increase their understanding and awareness? Part of it is also education. So a big part of my role has been helping parks employees understand HRA compliance. Um, it really was one of those things like, okay, we kind of know we have to do it, but do we really have to do it? And then the other education piece is obviously citizens. And we can't get to the point of public archeology span and celebrating these sites until there's conservation. And so that's the very first step. And this is where our parks are so important. Now, is there really anything here? I, 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 every presentation I give, people are like, I kind of get it, I, but is there? So here's a view from Scotsman's Hill. Right now, the Saddle Dome would be around here, but some early homesteads, Calgary in the background. The most interesting thing I find though, are the teepee rings, or the teepees, pardon me, in the mid ground of this uh, photo. Do I have, it was 1885 that this photo was taken. And evidence of most of what you see would still be there. So 1885, we had two very large floods. I think it was 1898 and then again in 1902. And those floods um, would have buried uh, a lot of, well, certainly the remains associated with the teepees, the any stone circles that were there. and a lot of the early um, settlement associated buildings that were closer to the riverbank were taken out by those floods and aspects of them would still be present in an archeological context deep beneath the surface. So I'm gonna to touch on a few of our parks and talk about some of the interesting archeological um, elements that we have in there and the history around them. And hopefully in talking about these parks, you can think about some of your projects going forward and consider what sort of information can we keep and how can we, you work with your clients to share that with citizens. So uh, Thomas Edworthy, he settled in 1883, he developed these market gardens and they were to feed folks at Fort Calgary. And he had a lot of the local uh, Sutina folks working on his land and they were uh, the potatoes that resulted from these market gardens were known as the Shaganappy Spuds, which is always an interesting little tidbit. Uh, he was quite a uh, ingenious fellow and he noticed the quarry or the sandstone outcrops on his land and he developed a number of quarries over the years and he ran them. He passed away in 1905, I believe, 
and he ran the quarries up to that point. And then after that, his wife took over and she leased them out, but she maintained ownership until the early 30s. Here's a great example of one of the quarries, and you can actually see this. The early method of extraction would be to wedge a lever down in between the plains of sandstone and break it off. This area was also um, just to the west of Edworthy's land. John Watson had a little place called Burnville Bricks. Now in 1905, he sold it to Henry, Edward Henry Crandell, and he was a very smart man. There was a CP whistle stop along there, and he had CP rename that whistle stop whistle stop to brick burn, which basically is the same brickworks, but an industrial village sprung up around this whistle stop. And brick burn was able to make 80,000 bricks a day. And a lot of those early bricks um, were used in buildings like the Mawada Armory. So the really old brick buildings in downtown, these bricks typically, if you find a brick that has E, HC, it's from um, stenciled onto it, it would be from Brickburn. Now, the archaeology of Edworthy hasn't been explored. This, the majority of this is known from historical accounts. And the, the, when the land was sold to, uh, to the city for a park, um, these sites would have been conserved. And there's opportunities for future work, absolutely. Further to the west, uh, William Tregolis, he, he was a, an interesting fellow. He was an entrepreneur and he wanted to build this giant brick plant. And because he had seen the success of Brickburn, now Brickburn, I believe it was 80,000 bricks a day and they had 100 people working there. Tregolis, he wanted, he produced a larger plant, he spent a million dollars on it, and he could make 150,000 bricks a day. But he had a lot more people working for him. And I think it was 500 men. And the math doesn't really make sense. Unfortunately for him, the depression of 1913 and the outbreak of World War One um, bankrupted him. And the plant had to close down before it really got up and running. So historic archaeology, yes, we have lots of opportunity in Edworthy, but we do also have a few pre-contact sites identified. There was a bison kill identified when the sewage line was going through there. And I think there were four different levels bone beds, one at six inches under the surface, one at 3.5 feet, one at four feet, and the deepest bone layer was at 12 feet beneath the surface. There's a very large stone circle on the uplands of uh, Edworthy. Based upon the size of it, we archaeologists typically will default to it li was likely ceremonial because it seems large, too large for um, a habitation TP, but if you are standing on that location and you look at the landscape around you, you can see Nose Hill in the distance, you can see the river valley snaking through the city, you can understand why it would have been used for ceremony, potentially. There's also a large campsite on the lower flats. Now this campsite it was found in a disturbed context. It's likely that Thomas Edworthy's market gardens uh, would have destroyed the majority of it. And uh, there could be intact elements deeper, but those haven't been explored. Nose Hill is another fabulous location that certainly draws people today. It's very prominent landscape. We have over 1,100 hectares. This <laughs> is a site. 
This is a view of EGPM 35. It's actually a scatter and campsite where they found hearths, but without knowing it was there, you would have no idea. This park was established in 1980, and at the time it was the northernmost portion of the city. And there was a lot of controversy over making it a park, but if we hadn't, uh, there's a bunch of sites that would have been impacted. We have a variety of stone circle sites. They're all across this upland. One of the things that we see in our parks is these desire lines where people go off trail and those sorts of things can actually impact sites. Um, they wear down, artifacts come to the surface and those are tertiary impacts to sites that archeologists always have to comment on in their reports, the potential of tertiary impacts to any sites that they leave unmitigated. Now, the coolest site, in my opinion, from Nose Hill is the Hawkwood site. And it was dug in the 1970s. You can, and it was done in December. They had Herman Nelson heaters and tents put up. And it's a multi-component site. So people have been going back to this location for thousands of years. The oldest or deepest layer was 8,250 years old. And so those were the lowest layers. So the radiocarbon date came from the lowest layer, I believe. And there was a second one. These large artifacts came from those. This is a Lusk point. Um, and these points were at the tail end of spear use. So very early. This is one of the earliest sites known uh, in Calgary. It was also used 6,000 years ago. Um, there's two different levels that dated to that time frame. And during this time frame, people would be using that atlatl. And the atlatl is very much, it's basically a lever similar to what you see in any dark dog park today, those chuckets where you throw the ball really fall up far for your dog. Uh, the technology started thousands of years ago and was used to throw spears from a further distance. And today's bison are big. Back then, they were a lot bigger. And so I certainly would want to be further away than closer. Um, so that technology probably saved a lot of lives um, for those hunters. And then Again, this site, uh, level five, was 4,000 years ago. And so archeologists, we look at the shape of projectile points and that will help us date a site if we don't have bone present. So we basically have a good chronology of shapes of points and how they relate to, they've been found in enough instances where bone was dated that if we find an oxbow point, we're pretty sure it dates to that certain time frame around 4,000. The best thing about these points is if you turn them upside down, they look like Mickey Mouse ears. That's the easiest way to remember oxbow points. So if you ever come across a point that looks like a Mickey Mouse hat, there you go, it's oxbow. So the site again was occupied in the last 1500 years. And so this plate is a bit deceiving. Only that point and that point are from this last period. These ones are from the earlier, level five. Um, and this one's from level five. So this little point, you can see it's much smaller than the rest. And this would reflect bow and arrow use. Today, there is a contemporary medicine wheel on site. I don't know if how many have gone up to see it. You should if you haven't had the opportunity. This is not an archaeological site. This um, in 2015 the Blackfoot Confederacy had a conference and um, reached out to the city for presenting for um, having this installed on the, on the hill and 
will be of course obliged and we're currently still working with them to determine the exact verbiage for the signs associated with this that will hopefully go up will hopefully go up soon <laughs> Pascafu is one of my favorite locations it is incredibly significant it has a highest the highest concentration of pre-contact sites along these slopes and most of them are really large bison kills um, it within the ravines you get the smaller kills that are really old 7,000 to 6,000 but all of those benches and uplands you have large kill sites and it reflected groups of people coming together building a pound driving bison into it um, year after year so you can tell a lot about the population when you start seeing these sorts of things this is one of the sites where this reflects all the excavation all that gray is bone uh, they would have been driven from the upper plateau down a specific lane they would have had a pit excavated where so that the animals once they were in the pound they couldn't come back out and then they would have just been dispatched within this area they typically date to this time range of 3600 to 2100 years old this particular site is referred to as EGPN 362 and it was a uh, I think there was 145 bison excavated or recovered identified at this kill site oh yeah there we go uh, incredibly dense and it was a cow calf herd so we can tell that it was a fall population if we see fetal bones we know it's a spring uh, kill event the Pelican Lake is the name of the culture or the shape of the projectile points. And they have the tanged deep corner notches. But you can see um, they are fascinating to excavate. They can be exhausting at times and it's quite meticulous, but you gain a lot of information. The whole area, this site, the Individually, these sites have a high significance. Collectively, they're known as the Pascapu Slopes Cultural Complex, and it is of provincial significance. Some people say it's more significant than head smashed in. Well, there we go. So I'm gonna to touch upon the volcano because a lot of folks don't realize this, and archeologists get super excited when we see this layer right here. So, most of us know where Crater Lake is in Oregon. Well, that used to be a volcano called Mount Mazama. And it erupted and about 7,700 years old, years ago. And it, the ash plume extended from the volcano location in Oregon north up to Edmonton. So this ash layer is a relative dating marker. And we know anything that we find below it is older than 7,700 years, which is really cool in archeologists' opinion. Um, but it helps us quite a bit if uh, we want to interpret these sites and it gives us another data set to interpret the age. Here's the 12 mile coulee site I was mentioning. This um, is actually the same site that I mentioned earlier that the guys had come across. Um, the Everblue Springs site at the north end of 12 mile coulee. And these are the different excavation blocks that were dug. They identified the primary kill area. This is where all the projectile points were found. And then you see the processing going on the periphery. And so at the time that this site was found, it dated to 7,800 years and it was the oldest uh, known kill site in Southern Alberta. So all of our parks have potential to have interpretive elements. So we at the city developed archeology span and Calgary parks uh, we have 16, I think, or 17 locations throughout that we have written histories. We have some waterways in there as well. And this is a tool 
just to help create awareness. And we have other opportunities to incorporate this information. These landscapes are historically significant. And if we can connect Calgarians to the past, it helps them view those landscapes in a different way. And as we all know, landscapes contribute to communities by enhancing a sense of place. And they help create that connectedness. So if there's archaeological information in your parks, or if you have archaeological information associated with your parks, what type of opportunity can you have for placemaking? So I hope you have kind of understand why I think that there's parks and open spaces are important. In Calgary, we have uh, 1,443 sites within the, the city limit. So 437 of those sites are in parks land. Only 149 have been conserved. And so you can start to see the disappearing nature of this way of life. And we all have an opportunity because we work with land to conserve. And at the very least, it's having the conversation with our clients to say, have you considered historic resources? Or do we have any opportunities here? So this is our last poll. Um, can landscape architects influence the conservation of archaeological resources? So 80% voted. So <laughs> I'm glad that the majority of you believe that yes, <laughs> you do have that opportunity. Um, we definitely can go from here and take this back to our colleagues and our clients and just have the conversation. And I guarantee you that there's historic resource consultants who would be happy to work with you, develop a relationship with the province so they know you and reach out if you come across anything. It really is on all of us to be able to uh, help conserve these resources. So with that, I know we don't have a ton of time for questions, um, but please uh, feel free. So just a reminder, um, I hope I'm, I'm unmuted. If you, uh, if you want to use the uh, raise hand feature, um, we can turn your, uh, your audio on if you want to verbally ask that question or pop it into the question box. Uh, question box, my goodness. There's always questions. Somebody must have one. It's a lot of information. I totally get it. Um, if anything, it's to get folks starting to think a bit more about what could be beneath the surface. I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, present. This was much harder webinar version than I thought it was going to be because I'm, I'm so used to like seeing people nod or fall asleep for that matter. Um, so it's something that we can all, I think, do better in. Well, since there doesn't seem to be any questions, I just want to take a second on behalf of the association to thank Lorene for her work today. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity. Um, this has been recorded and I will share it. Uh, it'll come out to all of you sometime tomorrow. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well. Um, but other than that, uh, thanks again to Loreen and to all of you for participation, participating. Um, 
good, uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, I'm sure most of you are working from home, so stay safe. Um, and as I said, everyone, please don't lick anyone's eyeballs. That seems to be a disease <laughs> transmission point. Um, if any of you do have, I'm going to shut the recording off here now, but if any of you do have a final question for Lorraine, I think she'll stay around for a few minutes. Just put your hand up and I'll throw your, your audio on for you. Other than that, thanks everyone and have a great day.